Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, thanks for the invitation to this conference. When I got the invitation, the first thing I was thinking about was what can a philosopher contribute to such a conference? So one of the bad things philosophers can do is to tell scientists what they have to do in the field of their expertise. And I will be the only thing uh, cooperating a lot with uh, scientists. And uh, that's what I would like to prevent, so uh, to avoid. So uh, I don't think that many of the current applications, applications of uh, intelligence processes really require the advice of philosophers. I don't think that they raise basic ethical questions that would require philosophical analysis. However, what I do think is that the upcoming development and the uh, huge steps that, and huge progress that is made in artificial intelligence currently uh, foreshadows a development that may raise, uh, may raise uh, relevant philosophical questions. So um, it raises the perspective that artificial intelligence, I mean, particularly given the problems that we have with uh, dementia and high age on the one hand, so there's a, there's a requirement or there's a, uh, a market uh, for this application and the develop as the uh, intelligent, artificial intelligence develops, there are, there's a potential to fill these needs. And so I think this raises a question. So I'm going to take some potential developments as examples, I'm not going to make any predictions of what is going to happen or what AI will be able to do in five years from now, or uh, ten years from now. So I think philosophers have an extremely bad record in making these predictions. Uh, I mean, it's not only philosophers that have a bad record, but also some of the artificial intelligence people, if you think about Ray Kurzweil. Um, but um, I think that this raises basic question, and these are questions where philosopher, philosophers can say something about. So what I do is I take possible developments as examples to discuss basic questions, and what I will focus on are possible effects on identity or stuff. So if you get a neuroprosthesis or a prosthesis or an implant, could that affect your personal identity or yourself? Uh, uh, your self-understanding, and could it affect uh, free will or your sense of responsibility or the actual responsibility that you have? So these are the questions that I will uh, talk about. And again, I'm not making any predictions as to when this will be possible. Okay. Um, <coughs> that's the way it doesn't work. Okay, so my claims will be that what is critical or what matters is not the substitution of cognitive functions by intelligence processes per se. Uh, these are not critical, that would be my argument, and I will try to convince you that this is the case, uh, as long as they are functionally equivalent. So if they do what the original brain functions do. What is critical is functional equivalence in itself, and it's critical for several reasons, I will try to explain some of that. So one of the problems is the severe lack of functional knowledge that we still have. I'm not denying any huge progress in neuroscience, but this progress notwithstanding there is a large lack of knowledge. And we take one basic issue, namely a basic misunderstanding regarding the complexity of intelligent abilities. Just to illustrate this, that's not the only one. Maybe that's a good example. Um, right, but that doesn't mean that these prosthetics or these implants cannot have any benefit. The benefit depends, of course, obviously, and that's where your expertise starts, uh, uh, starts with the situation of a patient. So a patient who has already very, very severe or whose uh, uh, sense of identity or his ability to make responsible decisions is already severely affected. There are, of course, a process that 
And that's the cognitive function only the way of cross grain sets might still have a benefit. But that's the last part. Well, let's first talk about personal identity. So sometimes people talk when they mean something like personal identity about the self. The self has been introduced in philosophy in the 17th century when it became somewhat unfashionable, uh, unfashionable to talk about the soul. So the sense is the self is some kind of entity that you may have somewhere. And then some philosophers came and opened up the brain and said, well, there is no sense, there is no self in the brain, so there can be no self. I think that shows how a, a ratification of cognitive functions leads to severe misunderstanding. What we can mean when we talk about the self are certain functions that are performed by the brain. Functions that result in something like personal identity, and that's something that we can talk about. That's something that we can understand. We cannot understand the self. Uh, so what the, the ten, second version of what are the most important features of personal uh, identity is it's a set of features and ability that make a person the person they are. And among those features are personality traits, so the so-called big five from uh, psychology, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, your specific beliefs and desires, and your political preferences, your religious beliefs or disbeliefs, basic goals, etc. Something like this. So these are, and of course, your body, and very importantly, your self understanding. That is, your ability to understand your preferences as your preferences or you believe that's your beliefs. That's something that small kids have to learn. And if before they have learned, they try to hide themselves by closing their eyes. So if one of these abilities is affected, then of course your identity and your sense of identity, which goes below us together, is affected. So let's assume we have a little process to this that is function, functionally equivalent with one of those abilities. Then it does not Effect or impede my self identity, it would help to do so. It would have to restore it. So the fact that there is some kind of silicon chip in my brain, as long as it actually maps the function of the original cognitive process or brain process, it does not affect my self identity and it does not affect uh, my experience. And uh, I mean, that may be an important point in the discussion. There is still an intuition around that experiential features are mysterious in some sense. They cannot be explained with reference to what goes on in the brain. I think this is based on a severe misunderstanding, and I would be happy to say something about it, but I don't think it's necessary for this lecture. So let's give you mind the, uh, the claim that what is relevant uh, is not the fact that a certain cognitive function is substituted by some uh, silicon chip. What is relevant is that it really maps the function, the original function. So just to, to give an argument for this claim, let's assume you, you have this ability to recognize your mental states as your mental states, or your belief as your belief. And this com that is a cognitive function. And if this cognitive function is performed by a circuit that's made from silicon rather than from um, or, um, biological tissue, that obviously does not change anything. And again, I would be happy to discuss the possible objections. So uh, the substitution of this fun uh, dysfunctional cognitive processes might even save identity relevant features. The open question, and that's the relevant question, is is functional equivalence achievable? What, what does it mean and is it possible to achieve that? Second example that I would like to give is how much time do we still have? Don't worry. Uh, that's the thing to answer for. <laughs> I can talk fiber about that. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. It's just a one way of time. <laughs> okay, so um, in order to discuss personal responsibility, a short clarification of freedom of work is necessary. So, basic assumption is in order to be responsible for an action, this action has to be free. 
Now, what does it mean that an action is free? Well, as you probably know, there is a huge discussion in philosophy going on for centuries about the compatibility between freedom and determinism. Many people think freedom. I, I have a clear view on that. I think if you have less determination, then what you get is chaos, or at least the loss of control. But I'm not, I'm not talking about this here, because uh, we can discuss uh, this question also independent of this philosophical control, uh, control. What The reason is that we can, I think, um, most philosophers, and I think also most people uh, outside philosophy, would agree that freedom has at least two minimal requirements. In order to be free and responsible in taking a certain action, first thing is you must not act under force, and the second requirement is that your action must not be a random event. Because the random, in both cases, your action wouldn't be under your control, and if it's not under your control, nobody can hold you responsible. And it wouldn't make sense to hold you responsible. So if we take these two minimal requirements, absence of external force and randomness, what we end up with, with something like self-determination. So if my action to come here to agree on that uh, conference was a self-determined decision, then of course I can help be held responsible for this decision. And uh, what does it mean to act in a self-determined manner? Well, it means that I am able to act according to my own preferences, which means according to my beliefs and my desires. And the last point that I want to this point that is relevant, these beliefs and desires have to be under my control. I mean, We'll be happy to say something about it, but I think uh, and should you give you an idea. So if I go to the Edi Cup in the Friedrich Straße station, take the, the, the chocolate and pay for it, because I think it would be a bad idea than to steal it, then uh, so then I act or then I most likely act in a self-determined way. The only additional requirement is that I should be able to give up the belief that stealing is reprehensible if I decide to do so. So that uh, belief has to be under my control. So that's the short version about it. So I hope you get a sense of what uh, uh, free will means. So if something like this is true, then acting freely is again an ability that depends on certain cognitive function, namely developing certain beliefs and desires and being able to act according to those beliefs and desires, and if necessary, change the beliefs and desires if uh, you have some good reasons to do so. Okay, if that is true, then, uh, this, then this, this, this can be used in order to uh, support the same thing that I made before. Normally, maybe if we have a neural process that replaces one of these abilities, for instance, some part of the decision-making process. And if this, uh, if this implant is functionally equivalent, so that it, that it does justice to my beliefs and desires in the same way that the original brain process did, then of course there is no reason to say that this changes my responsibility for the actions that I decide to do. So again, if, if given functional equivalent, there will be no change in freedom, relevant features and abilities, so my preference, beliefs, desires, decision-making strategies should not change. Quite the contrary, if they have been effect, uh, affected by certain, uh, by certain kind of dysfunction, then of course uh, such an implant might save my freedom, relevant features. But again, the open question is, is this what does functional equivalence mean? And can it be achieved? And that's uh, the next point on my list. So, functional equivalent means that a substitute maps the original brain function within the normal fluctuation margin. So, for instance, uh, we hold people responsible even if they are, uh, they are, they are precise beliefs and precise desires and the way they decide on the basis of these beliefs and desires 
changes to some extent over time. If it's completely inconsistent what they do, then we may, might ask ourselves whether they can really be held responsible. But in everyday life, we have, there is a certain error margin that we accept. And so I think we should apply this to these kind of situations as well. So uh, if you think uh, of a sense of self and what you need, for instance, an autobiographical memory, and of course, the, you know, the, the replacement or replacement of part of it, I think it's complete science fiction to replace an entire memory. Um, it should map the original uh, ability regard, uh, in terms of capacity, reliability, and the ability re to retrieve relevant information. Now, so in th this being said, I think there are two aspects of functional equivalence. One is uh, what I call, or what I suggest to call it structural equivalence, that is, that an implant maps the typical function across the relevant population. So in this case, functional equivalence uh, for, for memory would be that the implant has roughly the same ability that you would find in the relevant population of your patient. But that's obviously not enough because there are individual differences between if you really want to map for instance, a memory, then of course you have to do justice to individual uh, differences. Given that we are talking about, in one of our examples, about the sense of identity or the existence of identity, and therefore about personal preference, and of course your personal experience that you made in your life, and that may shape or probably will shape your decisions, the things that you think, uh, your, your beliefs and your desires. So you need more than just structural equivalence. Uh, you know, what, what is needed is the individual or idiosyncratic functions of a specific person. And I think, uh, and it, it seems obvious that what we need, when we're talking both about free will and we need my specific way of decision making, if you want to all be responsible. And if we are talking about self uh, uh, identity, then you need my, and if memory, my autobiographical memories are part of my identity, then you need this specific memory. And I think that already shows, this is something, I don't think that anybody has an idea, I and mean, maybe except Ray Kurzweil, who thinks you can download the content of a memory to a computer. Uh, I think his prediction was that we have these computers by the year of 2020. Uh, so that, that's obviously science fiction. So, yeah. Apart from that, there is no idea how to uh, how to come about this kind of information. So uh, yeah, I think I've already said this. So structural equivalence is already extremely difficult to achieve, but uh, idiosyncratic equivalence is something. So really, to map the, those features that are relevant for my uh, way of decision making, for my way of acting responsibly or acting irresponsibly, and of course for my uh, specific personal features. Um, so this is, I think that's the real problem, and I don't think that anybody has a solution. Um, in order to, just to order to illustrate the lack of knowledge that we have, so of course we could, uh, I could refer to the current methods that we have uh, in non-invasive brain science, but also in invasive brain science. I mean, if you take for instance brain reading as an example, the abilities that you have is to figure out if you have trained your subject and if you have trained the brain, brain classifier to two different conditions, uh, then the brain classifier can predict or can tell what your reason was or what you were thinking about when making a certain decision. This is an extremely low degree of information that we can figure out uh, in concrete situation. And so I think there is an extreme lack uh, of functional knowledge. But I think maybe something that is more interesting and informative is a misunderstanding, a basic misunderstanding regarding intelligence. So if uh, you would have asked me who is more intelligent, let's say, great soccer player who may even confuse Madrid and Milan or great philosopher, I would have said, yeah, probably the philosopher. But there are reasons to believe that maybe the, the soccer player is more intelligent than the 
lot of even a lot of can distinguish Italian and Spanish cities. And the reason is that and there are reasons particularly for AI. So what you what you probably know is that computers already I mean this computer here which is completely uh, comparatively stupid is able to calculate much better than any, anyone in the room. And other formal abilities, you know, uh, with and that is true with respect to almost all other formal abilities. So computers, for what we think are intelligent abilities, maybe mathematics, logic, etc., computers are much better. Computers are bad when it goes about motor knowledge. Think about self-driving cars. Um, and so the obvious reason is not that we are bad in teaching computers, but the obvious reason is that model knowledge is the basis that has been accumulated by evolution over millions of years. It's extremely complex, uh, but we just ignore this complexity because it's completely unconscious. And that is the reason why computers are so bad, even if they're quite intelligent. So if something like this is true, then what we think are complex functions, maybe doing math, logic, language, etc., isn't that complex. So we have a basic, and what we think is simple, namely modern knowledge, isn't that simple. So what I want to say is we have a deep misunderstanding already on this very, very basic level regarding uh, cognitive function. And just to illustrate um, this, uh, the, the, the previous point, once again, so there is no evidence, for instance, that our linguistic abilities, the higher cognitive function, capitalize on motor knowledge um, if you want to if you want to decode, for instance, a certain expression. So a uh, uh, linguist in, in Berlin, Friedman Kurmüller, has done experiments where he had asked the subject to uh, read and uh, classify uh, sentences with either containing a hand-related movement or a foot-related movement. And then the subjects had to move their foot, so they had to activate the, the part of the motor system that's relevant for, that controls your foot movement. Then they were faster in understanding word, foot-related words, and they were more slowly uh, in understanding hand-related, and vice versa. And when you knocked out when it's the foot-related part of the motor cortex, then again, the subject were more slowly in decoding Foot-related activity, uh, foot-related words, and hand-related words. There is quite some other evidence that the so-called higher cognitive function capitalizes on the so-called lower, uh, uh, lower cognitive knowledge. And the reason is that there is a huge bulk of knowledge which we ignore because we don't don't have cognitive access to this kind of knowledge. And that again is related. On one point, I think there are several points uh, where it's related to our problem. But um, the, the, the point that is most important for, uh, for my argument is that this illustrates uh, the lack of knowledge that we have even regarding basic functional complexity. That was, yeah, oh no, no, no. Uh, yeah, that, that was, so this is called uh, this, the fact that uh, computers are so bad at, um, uh, at controlling movements and they are so good as, uh, at control, doing higher cognitive function has been called in the discussion on I, uh, in I more or less, uh, paradox. So that's the expression. Okay, uh, so uh, does this mean, so summary to the point where we are is, I have made a claim that uh, what is, what counts is Functional equivalence is if an implant is functional equivalent to a cognitive function, and that would include cognitive in a very, very broad sense. That would also include, for instance, experiential properties. So if you have, you probably, well, the, 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 uh, many good doctors among you know that don't have a normal pain experience is a very, very bad condition for someone's life. And so restituting uh, this ability would be. Uh, a very, very important ability. And again, uh, that would include, in order to be functionally equivalent, that would include the pain experience. The pain experience and the emotional experience in general does work. So if you want to have functional equivalence, then you need uh, this experiential, the, the, the 
equivalence with respect to experience because experience is functionally relevant. So the problem is not the basic point, the problem is that it's difficult to figure out what exactly is the function that, for instance, uh, your particular pen experience does. Okay. So uh, does this mean, so if, if it's so difficult to figure out uh, the functional, uh, precise functional properties, what does that mean that we have to refrain from using uh, complex neural processes? I think this is something I know entering again the area where your expertise is much higher than mine. And obviously, this is not the case uh, if we uh, have severely damaged natural functions that affect personal identity anyway. Then, of course, in the case of severe retrograde uh, amnesia or severe damage to memory or decision making abilities, then, of course, even the lack of functional knowledge of the, uh, uh, an implant that only causally maps the original function uh, features may already have a benefit. But that's something that's obviously. So let me summarize. So uh, I try to show that in the current situation, the development in artificial intelligence enables or foreshadows the possibility of more complex uh, processes uh, that seems to require uh, that we already think about future developments. Now that's what I'm uh, trying to do. Uh, I try to show that intelligent processes for higher cognitive function are not critical per se. Uh, what is critical is the severe lack of functional knowledge that we have, and uh, that raises ethical questions. But I think um, even given this severe knowledge, certain improvement may be possible in case of severe impairments. Uh, what can we do today? We'll kind of try to better understand those basic problems, and, but uh, concrete solutions and guidelines are difficult because, uh, and that is also an important point, uh, that our ambitions might be misleading when we talk about uh, events in the distant future. So I can imagine that most of you will know the so-called Turing test. We will try to figure out uh, whether an artificial system has, uh, is, uh, is conscious. Imagine that somebody would have done the Turing test with a uh, chat GPT many years ago. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. So we have time for questions. I think you made a number of assumptions that um, can be now questioned. So Should be. opportunity. So exactly. Yeah, we have a question. Okay. Thanks for a very inspiring talk. Uh, my point is the functional growth right. is a good concept. Is it what? Is it is a good concept to start with? Hmm? But what happens if you using neuroprostheses go beyond what you can do at the moment? If a prosthesis is just replacing or compensating for a lack of function, that's okay. But if you use prosthesis or implanted devices or whatever have you as an augmentation of what you could do, right? Yeah. Then the situation changes completely. I'm not so sure. I mean, I, I thought whether I should uh, uh, enter a section on enhancement, and my example would have been memory. And I think, I mean, again, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not telling you what's true in medics. But I think memory is an interesting example because just adding the amount of information that you can memorize may not be a good thing. It, I mean, it would, it, from my naive perspective, it would be great. I just read a book and can memorize the entire book. Sounds great. But not, you don't want to memorize everything. I, uh, particularly, I don't want to store up or fill up my memory with all the memories from the people I've seen in the s when going here. And I even less so want to remember all the bad things that happened in my life or happened yesterday, for instance, when I tried to look for the, the lecture hall and didn't find it, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I think a certain control and a certain um, degree of cognitive functions uh, might be great because the brain is a system that is highly controlled. And if you put one 
part of the, or replace one part of the system with another part, which is much better in certain respects, that might be bad for the entire system. It's like taking an old car, putting in an engine which has twice the capacity, and then you probably end up in front of a tree. That's why I think the functional equivalence does not only hold because we have to avoid situations in which we do an implant which is less capable than the origin. I think in many cases it might also be critical to put in something that is more capable. That's at least, the, I mean, that's obviously um, a, a case where you cannot do it from the philosophical armchair. You have to, you, you need empirical evidence. Uh, thanks for your talk. You seem to suggest that personal identity is something constant. Oh, yeah. But isn't it changing all the time? Yeah, of course it is. Try yeah. to maintain something Absolutely. which is not constant at all? Uh, absolutely, yeah. But that adds a dimension. That, yeah, I was thinking about, uh, whether, whether to add this explicitly. That adds a dimension of complexity to the, to the picture. So uh, in the picture that I have painted, you just need the current state because I ignored the, the dynamics. But I had one point where I briefly pointed to this. I mean, the same goes for, for your beliefs and desires. They are constantly changing as well. Yeah? And on the one hand, I have two answers on that. On the one hand, I've, I did talk about some kind of normal fluctuation or something like that. But that is not the complete answer. So it's not normal fluctuation that you just back and, and uh, for, but um, it, there can also be a constant dynamics. And of course, I mean, if it is supposed to be, for instance, my system of preferences, then of course, it should in some way map the dynamic as well. And the same goes for the person. I mean, think about, think about a small child. Yeah, you're doing a replacement in a small child, which even at this point doesn't have the ability to, uh, to, uh, to recognize, so it doesn't have self-consciousness at that point. It's not, it fails false belief tasks. Everybody knows what false belief tasks are? You don't have the ability to recognize your beliefs as your beliefs and confuse them with the reality. So, uh, of course, in this case, we want this child to, make, to have a normal development, otherwise that was, would a severe impairment. Yeah? So, but that adds a further, uh, further dimension of complexity, makes it even more difficult. I mean, you could maybe replace an old one after a while when the child has grown older, et cetera. So there may be ways around. But. Much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you yeah, very no much. And I like that the philosopher kicks off this uh, conference. First principles first, that's very good. But of course, it's also a little bit uh, top down. So I would like to challenge you a little bit bottom up from okay. like real cases. So um, one of the conditions you mentioned were uh, control over one's preferences and desires. Yeah. And there's like a type of cases that come up with medical intervention that is that clearly the medical intervention produces certain desires, sexual desires, right. or buying behavior, compulsive behavior. Let us assume yeah. these preferences are implanted in this way. The persons are still have sufficient self-control to, to control their behavior, but not their preference formation. Would you think they are responsible? That's a typical case. If they are not responsible, would that imply they should not take the medical intervention, because we would create irresponsible responsibility zombies, so to speak, walking around there. We, and we shouldn't have that, perhaps. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, I mean, yeah, I know. I mean, that's, a, that, for instance, deep brain stimulation with Parkinson patients. There were these cases, right? Uh, I think you don't, that's not a case where you can, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get out of the, um, uh, <laughs> the problem. I just don't think there is, no perfect solution. Yeah? It's a trade-off uh, between the severity of the patient's situation and the patient's disability and the lack of the severity of the lack of control that is possible. And probably the most, I mean, I have been, um, I don't know whether this is still state of the art, but I have been at a conference at the Charité several years ago about deep brain stimulation and one one, um, what should I say, upshot of the conference was that the mechanisms 
at this time, at least, were completely unclear. So I think better understanding the mechanisms might maybe give us a possibility to avoid the side effects. But again, the, the, the short version of the answer is it's a trade-off, and we have to make individual decisions. I don't think that there is one great philosophical trick where you can go, get out of that trade-off. Yeah, um, my point is the problem of humanization. Mm -hmm. Try to explain, to define, and to act um, uh, um, uh, one to one um, human to uh, AI. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, it may be better. Uh, um, we have the, the possibility in the biotechnology or, or in uh, genetic, but it's uh, I is the, the another um, the, the, um, uh, space. So, uh, I mean, the, we should have uh, the, um, the, uh, make it better than what we are, but not just as we are. You mean, I'm not completely sure that I understand. So you mean that if we provide prostheses or implants, then these implants should be better as the original function? Or do you think the problem is that it's necessary but difficult to achieve to make, for, for instance, possible patients understand what these implants do? Yes. Also, um, why just uh, uh, should be uh, the same as we are? Also, uh, if we do that, we, we, uh, we, we, uh, we do that very complicated. As uh, 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 um, uh, an example, and, uh, yes, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. just I, I, I think uh, this um, um, all uh, try trying to um, um, can't speak humanize. Can't translate. No hum, human. Yes. Why? Why uh, um, is 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 is, the, is it uh, not problematic to it, humanize all these? Um, um, the, uh, what about other character of IE? Just my my problem. I'm not we, sure what you mean by humanizing. Uh, I think this lady in in the second row. She has. Just give me an idea of humanizing, then I don't understand. Does humanizing mean that we have to explain to potential patients what the AI implant does? Is that the question? We can also speak Deutsch, I can't speak it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if I just to translate it into English, so the basic idea seems to be that if we have this artificial implants or prostheses, they give us the potential for improvement. For instance, in vision, so we know that the human visual system is restricted to very, very small section of, um, of electromagnetic radiation, and we could go beyond that. Uh, and of course, think about the auditory system. They're the same ones. If you think about ultra, uh, ultrasounds or infra uh, sounds. I'm not so sure about that. 
I mean, there have been these, uh, has been this discussion on, on, uh, on enhancement uh, by uh, pharmacolog uh, pharmacological, so uh, that has, as far as I can see, that has become very, very quiet. Uh, and then also with, um, with um, artificial, um, uh, in artificially intelligent implants. Let's assume, so I'm also kind of a musician. Yeah? I like listening to stuff. And I, I also want to improve my, my auditory abilities. But I never thought it would be great to hear ultrasound. I mean, what, what would be the addition? Then you could, I mean, when there, when there are people running around with their dog, they have these pipes which, which are on other side. That you could hear. Is this really? And probably your ability to, to listen to a Mozart symphony would deteriorate. Yeah, because you would have some, some noise that you normally wouldn't hear. So I don't think that this, and that's the general point that I would make. I don't think the, the idea to improve our abilities by improving part of the system, that this makes very much sense. Because it would disturb the function of a system which elements or which, which uh, are highly controlled by each other and highly depend on each other. Now, I mean, that's, again, I've already said, that's my opinion. And that's open to empirical research. So you could try to figure out, could, I mean, if there are these, uh, these enhancements uh, available, then try to do it. I mean, what we actually have, think about um, retina implants, yeah? I mean, that is so far from natural human vision. I think we should postpone the discussion about that. But that, that's another point. Yeah, we could lead a discussion in principle, and that would say, Yeah, thanks for a very talk. Um, I have two questions. The first one is uh, uh, concerning um, your focus on cognitive substitution. And I was trying to understand if uh, your focus on cognitive substitution is kind of ruling out the possibility of what is called in cognitive psychology cognitive transformation. So uh, in, in cognitive psychology, there is a distinction between cognitive outsourcing and transformation. Outsourcing is when we just use technology to outsource, delegate processes that we are not uh, implementing internally. But then uh, there is also some evidence that the way we interact with technology cannot simply outsource or allow us to outsource processes, but also to transform the way we think, so transform the mental representations that we used to think. Uh, it's a kind of controversial evidence, but there is a body of evidence, for example, the so-called Google effect, that the way right, we yeah, store yeah. information and stuff yeah. can change the way we think. So I was just wondering what's your uh, take on that. And then relatedly, um, I was on the ethics side. Uh, if I understood correctly, you started out by saying, well, neural interfaces are ethically unproblematic, or at least less problematic than uh, most people think, but then your entire talk is focusing on identity. So I wonder whether you only deem as morally problematic possible uh, interferences in a person's cognitive domain that modify a person's sense of self, um, and therefore whether you consider something like, so AI can be used not just for uh, override a person's intention, but also, for example, to access information, so domain of mental privacy, or for example, to uh, execute, ex exercise some form of irrational influence in people. So I wonder if you consider these scenarios as unproblematic as long as they have nothing to do with personal identity. No, uh, regarding the last question, no, I don't think that this is problematic, uh, unproblematic, sorry. Uh, but I think we already have, let's say, the ethical instruments for assessing these. So I think we already have uh, criteria for, for instance, privacy, privacy, certain rights of personality, et cetera. And I think they apply in these cases. So if you would use, for instance, a brain reading machine in order to figure out my beliefs on the IFD, then of course that would be a breach of that kind of personality, um, that, that privacy, but that's something we can already deal with. And practically speaking, I mean, if we just see what effort you have to do in order to figure out, uh, to, to, to do brain reading, and I don't think that this will change so profoundly in the, in, in the time being. 
Uh, therefore, I think the actual risk that we have severe breaches of, say, personality or privacy, that this is so, uh, this risk is so high. I mean, the problems of, of privacy, I think, rise in completely different areas. When you put your entire private, uh, private life to Facebook or so, I think that is, that is much more severe concern for my, but again, I'm not denying the possibility, but I'm only saying the, 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 the answer to your question is, um, I think there is a problem, but we already have the tools to, to address this problem or to, to uh, uh, assess it. And the first question is, is there an interference or an effect of say external use of intelligent technology on thinking. Yes, it is. I mean, the Google effect, that is something you can, that has already been mentioned in a discussion between Plato and Socrates, where um, Socrates is um, very, very angry about the invention of uh, writing and says, well, that's bad. All the people, will they will forget all what they've thought. And then you have a similar discussion in Petrarca, the Remedies in, the, I think, 13th century, where books had been written by hand. And they say, well, there are so many books around. Uh, that, is, that is terrible. Again, for, for your memory, et cetera, et cetera. So we had this discussion, and I think it's right. Yeah, people in, in the Greeks were able, and the, and the, and the Roman um, um, orators, uh, speakers were able to memorize their entire speeches. And the Greeks were able to, in, to, to memorize the, the, the Ilias and the Odyssey. And the, the early Christians were able to memorize all the speeches of Jesus Christ for, I think, 30 years or something like that. Then they began to write, write them down. Yeah? So there is a loss of memory. But I think, I mean, if, if Plato wouldn't be, weren't able to write, then we wouldn't know about Socrates' crit, uh, criticism of writing. So I think it does have some advantages. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, first, first, thank you so much. I found that extremely enlightening for my thinking as a framework uh, through which to think about these questions. I'd like to return to the uh, question that my colleague uh, Christoph at the back uh, raised earlier. And the focus is on um, this question of having your preferences under one's own control. And let me just pr provide a vignette and then I'll ask my question. So in looking at um, a minority of patients who receive deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, you see these accounts of uh, development of hypomanic behavior, whether it's uh, mm -hmm. sexual or spending or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And um, also reading the accounts of those patients and their family members uh, as they react to this change in behavior, right. um, there's apparent a, dis a, a change in behavior, but also a change in preferences and values, mm -hmm. which is driven by the device. So right. people enjoy it. Uh, they, um, they, they want to remain with it, right? And this causes interpersonal difficulty and right. a range of other problems. And so I guess my question I'd like to ask you is a mixed question of philosophy and psychology, neither of which are my, mm -hmm. my domain, which is if we wanted to develop uh, a functionally equivalent device, how do we think about this question of what it means to have one's preferences under one's own control? Because it changes our behavior, it changes how we feel about our behavior, our whole motivational right. structure and emotions change. So from that I conclude that to have a functionally equivalent device we should, should somehow be preserving the motivational or behavioral Absolutely, yeah. structure. But to a philosopher, what else do we worry about when we try to think about what it means to have one's preferences under one's control, and how does this distinguish from the natural formation of one's own preferences? And there's a, it's a complicated problem here because one's preferences are part of the social environment. We learn them um, through development, mm -hmm. we learn them as signals from um, people around us about our own behavior. Um, so there's a, it's not just a device and an atomized individual, but our preferences are part of a social context. So how do we think about the functional equivalent equivalence of having control over one's own. Right. Yeah, uh, maybe. So I already said, I, I did not want to say that this is unproblematic. I think it is problematic. The only thing I wanted to say is that is something that, is, uh, that, that, that um, doctors are already aware of, so you don't need to, uh, specific philosophical advice, or but I can say, still say something about it. And you are completely right. The, the I, my main part of my idea of free will is that we have control over our preferences. And control over the preferences mean that just 
to simplify things, that if you decide to change one of your preferences, then you should be able to do so. So, and um, because I had this, um, this example of stealing or my belief that stealing is reprehensible, when I was a student in Marburg in the 1970s, stealing under certain conditions was not thought to be reprehensible, <laughs> particularly if you get the um, daily needs of, uh, of your flat sharing community by going to the local department store and take them. And so we had, and it was it, not only because it fit the need of the Fletcherian community, but also it was a good act in the fight against capitalism. And so we had these discussions at night, and now I go to the realm of fiction. So imagine that in the discussion I was convinced that I had, been, I was, I used to believe that stealing is reprehensible. And if I really, the criterion of control means that if my, the, the other members of my flat sharing community convince me to change my preferences, namely that stealing is not reprehensible, then I should be able to do so. Actually, I wasn't able. I tried to steal and then <laughs> brought it back. Uh, and and that, that would mean that I'm not free and responsible when, I'm, when I pay for the stuff in, the, in Edeka and the Friedrichstraße. The problem with the deep brain stimulation is the way you describe this is example means that the change preference, for instance, change sex preference, I mean, that's the, 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 the reports that I, I have read, they, aren't, they cannot be changed by the patients, obviously. They depend on the stimulation. And if that is true, then there is an obvious lack of control and an obvious change of self, namely the, the, the relevant preferences of the self. And of course, uh, let's, uh, in, uh, it's, it's, it's a change of uh, responsibility or a lack of responsibility in this case from the side of a patient. Yeah, so I think it's, it's a problematic uh, intervention, but I mean, it has to be, uh, has to be uh, taking into account what the positive effect is, whether that's uh, worse. And obviously the patient may not be able to make that judgment, particularly if the patient likes the change as you report. So we have a lot of food for thought, but I thought there is one very last question that uh, we still have time for. So Elke, please, if you have this question. Um, I really enjoyed hearing this and, and I enjoyed your question too, because I was wondering about the social aspects of knowledge mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. Um, for example, when it comes to responsibility, in Germany, as far as I know, as you are an actor on the stage, for one hour afterwards, you are not responsible. When you are, for example, driving a car, mm -hmm. you're not fully responsible. Why? Because it's accepted that the social event of being on the stage does something to your competence, to your brain. And everything which makes us human to rehumanize the discussion is social. Right, yeah. Or what we learned, we right. learned by other people. Yeah. So the idea, what I, I saw represented here from knowledge to replace is what it's, to me, is the less interesting stuff like counting or mm -hmm. other yeah, of course, yeah. competences. Yeah. But everything relating to us, like, like probably each medicine person, parent, professor knows is that what, what you know, you know also not structurally by other people in developing, but you know it actually by... R absolutely, absolutely, yeah. What yeah. we do here yeah. is that we figure out what we know in talking to each other. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I didn't, yeah, I'm still searching for this elementary aspect in thinking about what knowledge means and how you can replace any kind of competence. For example, when you have very old people who re remember stuff by singing, singing with special right, yeah, people, yeah. not with everybody, not with YouTube, what does that say about knowledge? That would be, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it says that there are different levels of knowledge and it, to, to some extent fits into the last point of my talk, namely the relevance of motor knowledge. I mean, there are reports, for instance, about pa Parkinson patients who have severe motor disabilities 
and I think there was once a report about a, a dancer who almost can't move, and when, they, when she listens to the music she used to dance to, then she started dancing. That seems to show that motor knowledge is something that's, that's kind of a class or a client range of it, all, which, might, which might be realized also by different areas which are not so much affected by, but that's my personal theory about it that may be false. But I once was on a consequence, and this, something like, something very similar seems to hold for musical knowledge and musical abilities. They seem to be specific and can be as affected by specific disabilities. So yes, there are different, uh, different sorts of knowledge, and the point that I wanted to make is that our evaluation of these different sorts of knowledge might be very, very much biased. And that me also means that the sort of knowledge, the motor knowledge, that we don't evalu evaluate so highly might be much more important. And this, this example from linguistics is something. The other point that you seem to make is the relevance of social interaction for knowledge generation. I, two points. I mean, there's obvious very, very strong evidence, particularly from social psychology, for the relevance of social knowledge from extremely early on in evolution. I mean, already fish have social abilities that help them to, for instance, evade a bad environment just by swimming a bit faster, and then the whole swarm changes the direction and goes out of the, uh, of the bad environment. So they have sometimes very, very simple tricks. The other point is, well, we do the same if we are under certain, it's, you may uh, know these uh, experiments by Solomon Ash where the subjects had to say they, had, uh, they were shown three lines, one this size, one this size, and the other one that size. And then they had a com uh, standard, and they should say that this size, this line is like this one. Extremely simple, 99% of the subjects got it right under normal conditions. And then they would be put into a specific social environment where seven participants before them said, this line is like this, that line. And with the chance of almost 40%, you would say yes. Yeah? That shows without any, any pressure. Yeah? And one could explain that. It, it, social information transfer is extremely important. It's one of the most important uh, features of social communities, learning. It, but it leads to some sometimes crazy. So uh, where this fits into what I've been talking about is the ability to take up these signals from your environment, from your social environment. It's a social or the cognitive ability as well. And that can be impaired. I had a father who had this, let's say, private beliefs. Uh, that can be impaired, and it may be good for those people if it can be restored within the limitations that it normally is. So I think it's also a point uh, that where the criteria of functional equivalence might might uh, apply. All right.